I'd like to get started by, by, by asking how many of you consider yourself to be a philanthropist? Not too many hands up there. And that's exactly why philanthropy today is failing. One out of three people in Latin America live in slums. This accounts for over 180 million people that live with under $2 a day. And I believe this is happening because we're stuck in an old paradigm. In this old paradigm, we understand, we conceive, and we truly live by the premise that poverty will always exist. And what's worse about this paradigm is that as a society, you, me, and everybody, we've delegated dealing with these issues, not solving it, dealing with these issues to the governments, the religious institutions, the Bill Gates, and the Warren Buffetts. And we just haven't gotten involved enough. Now, what if I told you that seven university students they got together and started dreaming a different country of their own. And not only did they dream it or talk about it, but they became responsible towards making it happen. This was happening in Chile in 1997. While Chile was economically booming, it was politically stable. Yet there were 90,000 families that were living in slums. These university students, they came across an amazingly forward-thinking Jesuit who had the notion that Chile was like a glass of water that would never fill up because it had two major cracks. On the one side, you had the university students, the empowered youth with every single opportunity at hand, yet they were only thinking of their own success. And on the other hand, you had the families living in slums, who had absolutely no chance of grabbing on to all the good things that Chile was going through, and they were only thinking of surviving. Now, he had a radical idea, which was to tie both of these ends together. And what was born from that is Techo a movement that has built over 90,000 houses. It's mobilized over half a million youth volunteers, and there's no one hired above the age of 30. Now, right there, you can see how Tetris is disrupting this model, how it symbolizes a new paradigm, this paradigm of the active responsibility, where we've come to understand that unless each and every single one, and single one of us, takes an active approach towards solving these problems, they will never get solved. And this new paradigm is made up of three concrete concepts. The first of them has to do with the massive engagement. The second one, with the bottom-up thinking. And the third of them, having a cease-to-exist approach, to having a very ambitious long-term goal, yet very concrete and tangible to one day go out of business. And I'd like to start with a massive engagement, and particularly with my own personal story. That's me in high school. <laughs> looking almost like Harry Potter. <laughs> a visitor in my own country, a tourist in the broad sense of the word, going by the city and just seeing slums as everyday urban scenery. To me, slums were just there. Not once did I challenge the idea of their existence. Now, it's also me, in the single most exciting moment of my life, where for the first time I connected with what makes up a very large part of my country, and I did so by working alongside real people that were facing real problems. Stories of enormous effort, humility, all these values that went incredibly against all the social prejudice I had before going into that slum. And that slum was just 10 minutes away from my house. Later, I got to travel across the region. I've been to Mexico, Haiti, Colombia, Uruguay. And everywhere I went, I got to meet hundreds of volunteers that had had the same experience that I had, that they had seen a reality that now they just couldn't turn their back on. They now felt responsible for changing that reality. And even more than responsible, they started to know that there's nothing structural about poverty except for the structural mindset that generates it. And that's how the massive engagement is key, because it's through the massive engagement that poverty stops being about statistics or numbers, and it starts being a connection, an emotional connection between, between two different people. And that changes everything. I never thought I was responsible for overcoming poverty. I never thought I would end up working at a place like Techo. Yet here I am, and yet there are over half a million people across the region that are now thinking differently. And it's also through that emotional connection that we started seeing the value, the potential, and the need of incorporating their ideas into everything that we did. So that's how we came across the second concept, this idea of the bottom-up thinking. I think for too long in the old paradigm, we've lacked a listening approach. We've tried to find solutions in the universities, in the science labs, or the high-ranking government offices, but we haven't incorporated enough the people that are suffering these problems. 
And that's why I want to go back to that first build I was telling you about before. That's Juan. Juan had been incarcerated for seven years. When I dare to ask why, he said he had been in the middle of a shootout while dealing Paco. Paco is one of the most harmful drugs attacking our slums. A couple weeks after, I was visiting, and over lunch, I mentioned how I had seen that a new ditch had been dug out throughout the entire slum. And that's when Juan jumped up and told me, well, you guys came here, we built together a house for my family, and I just felt the responsibility in continuing your work. So here's this guy who may have even killed someone, who was dealing the most harmful drug, all of a sudden not thinking about philanthropy. He was talking about responsibility, about how he himself was responsible of generating change in his own community. And even what was also very enlightening for me about Juan's story is that we started noticing how the houses we were building by themselves were not overcoming poverty, that the families living in slums needed many different things. In this case, a ditch, for example. And that's how we came around incorporating health programs, education programs, legal aid, skills training, where the key of that process is having the families living in slums lead the way and tell us what it is that they need. And really having that bottom-up thinking trickle down into everything that we do. Because I believe that in the old paradigm, people living in slums were invisible, or they were, in a sense, too poor to volunteer. And we started to radically change that as well. For example, in Argentina, we have a benchmark to have at least 20% of our volunteers come from slums. Or in a country like Haiti, where 71% of the population lives in extreme poverty, a vast majority of our volunteers are local Haitians. And still, I think there was a missing ingredient, because once we've understood the importance of the massive engagement and the bottom-up thinking, I think having that cease-to-exist approach, really having that concrete, tangible goal of one day eradicating poverty, that's what makes me the most passionate about digital. The fact that I know that I will someday take my kids well, if not my grandkids, to a museum of poverty. Just try to get your hand around the idea that on the day we eradicate the last slum on Earth, we'll have the grand opening of the museum of poverty. And we've taken steps in that direction, because truly by understanding what the families were going through, we also started understanding what was failing regarding public policy across the region. So, for example, in Chile, when it came to social housing, the government was very old paradigm thinking. They saw poverty as only a housing issue, so they would just go on by themselves and just build houses. And that was not solving poverty. So in the new process, where we got them to privatize social housing, we're leading the way by coordinating the work with the government officials, the private sector for additional support, the construction company and the slum leaders, where everybody is very clear about their responsibility in moving forward. And since that change, which happened in 2007, We've transformed over 400 slums into actual sustainable neighborhoods. And Antofagasta, a region in the north of Chile, made up of around 600,000 inhabitants, will be free of slums by July next year. And that's how the new paradigm is generating results in such little time, because we've truly come to understand that slums are a reflection of how we think as a society. And it'll be on the day that our dictionaries read slums, a reflection of how we think as a society, that the new paradigm will take flight everywhere in the world. And the combination of the bottom-up thinking, the massive engagement, and the cease-to-exist approach will lead us to a conversation way bigger than philanthropy. We're going to start talking about changing the world. And if it's easy for you to say that we've been able to do these things in countries like Argentina or Chile, I want to go back to a case for Haiti. Before we started working in Haiti, we heard in classic old paradigm thinking, you will never find volunteers in Haiti. Haiti is too poor. Forget about Haiti. Well, of course, we went in there regardless, right after the earthquake in 2010. And since then, we've built over 2,000 houses, and we've mobilized over 5,000 volunteers. And most importantly, Olson, a Haitian volunteer, he's our new executive director in Haiti. He's a true symbol of the new paradigm taking flight in a country like Haiti. And just to me, in general, people like Juan and Olson, they're the new philanthropists. So my question to you is, what are you going to do to join them? Thank you.